Okay, great. Hello. Uh, we have been in Cork before, it's not the first time. Um, we think it's a great, a great town and it's a pleasure to be here. So we're all here today, but the um, family has gone to the hotel and my son thinks that talking about art is boring, so he's not here. <laughs> I'll try and make it not boring for you guys. So, um, oh, that's me, yeah, all right. Well, okay, so you've probably put that together. I'm going to talk about the early days when I was at Croydon. I'll just um, go through it as quickly as I can. Uh, I started work when I was 15. I was a typesetter, worked in a factory, had nothing when I left school, no papers, no nothing. And then I wanted to go back to art school because I always had some idea of culture in me, put there, I think, by the house that I lived in in the Catholic school that I went to in Islington. And my grandmother big, had a big house. We all lived there and there was a lot of interest in storytelling, pictures, visual beauty, mystery, folk tales, so on. My mother was a singer, almost famous, not quite. And uh, we used to go to the uh, coastal towns in England when we were little, and she would enter talent contests. So we'd find out where the talent contests were, She'd enter and she'd always win, and then we'd have a holiday. And that's how we find that's the holidays, quite good. So I grew up with a sense of beauty and culture that came from a very Irish context in Islington. And uh, I'm not one of those people that's a Catholic school basher, I'm the opposite. And so when I got to be a teenager, later on, I returned to this idea of wanting to do something that was concerned with beauty or spirituality. So I tried to get into art school and I got refused by 11 art schools in London. Every single art school that you've ever heard of said no, except Croydon, which was a school for dances and I managed to get into the Croydon Art School. That brings you up to date. That's where I did these. So I used to draw obsessively and do portraits of people. This is done with a red pencil. Red pencil, you know, you, can, you can't erase. You can only add. So uh, uh, by the time I made this, I was very proficient. Um, I used to draw all my friends and sit around in the evening talking. That wasn't one of my friends. <laughs> and I, I used to like to grow cactuses. And I later on realized why I like cactuses, because I think that cactuses are somewhat like artists in the sense that they flower when they feel like it and they're somewhat prickly. And, and, they know, and they know how to live on very little. You know, they don't, they need very little encouragement. When I first started making art, I thought that one day, like Gully Jumpson, I could have a retrospective in the Tate Gallery, and that would be it. I had no idea that it would be like it is now, where I have hundreds of exhibitions and I'm not the only one, and it's developed into an industry. Anyway, I made this before I went to art school. So I like to joke that I went to art school so I could learn to paint stripes, and I started out doing that before I went to art school, so I could already paint in a certain way. This is, a, this is a drawing, if you have to look at the date here, 
It's a drawing of a painting that I made in 1964 and I made the drawing in 2010 because I don't have a painting anymore. I sold it to a guy who taught me politics when I was at Croydon Art School. I used to go to the evening classes. I've always very, very determined, hard-working guy. This guy was very nice to me and I had made a big green painting of these women bearing arms in the French Revolution from an old etching or something. And um, I, I wanted to have the drawing because I didn't have the painting anymore. So that, that's from 2010. So in other words, I can still draw phys um, figuratively. This is when I fell in love with uh, continental art, when I fell in love with German Expressionism, basically. The freedom of the colors and the open spaces, the precarious relationship with the subject, the losing of fidelity with realism, this area in between that of course is a little bit like jazz where you hear the standard song that is being referred to but then it loses reference to it and comes back at the end if you like jazz. There's another one, little oil painting. These are always in, invariably of my girlfriend of the time because she was the one who would sit and put up with me staring at her which she didn't mind and here you see that the space gets kind of um, loose, open to interpretation has a vague relationship with the original subject matter like some things are more abstracted than others you see a teacup, it's quite clearly a teacup, but then what goes on in the pink space becomes difficult. It's not, it's, uh, the word improvisation comes to mind. So all this time I was making this figurative work. This was al always at Croydon in the 60s, the early 60s, 64. But then I made these one day and I'm not even sure why. But I was attacking everything when I was a young artist. I had a very wide range of interests. This is quite a conceptual little work. It's important to note that my first job was a typesetter, so it was in the print, and in the print used halftone in those days, before we were digital. In fact, when I was a child we had gaslight. It was in the uh, Triassic period. <laughs> <laughs> Guy used to come round and light the street lights, and we had gaslight in our house. No heat, but gaslight. So that's what really re referring, in a sense, to the technique of half tone. You creates density according to how closely the lines are put together. But of course, it looks like a minimal artwork now. I made these curves, I was running through everything. These were relating, of course, to waves, water, so on. And this is beautiful, I think, all with oil crayon. So it's really oil, oil paint, in a sense. They're called oil, oil crayons and them mix in the colors. So these are all ideas for future paintings some of which came to pass. This is an early painting at Newcastle. Now, when I got to Newcastle, I had become educated somewhat. I still didn't know who um, Truffaut was, for example. But I had learnt quite a lot, and I'd studied, and I'd got some A-levels which allowed me to go to university. And when I got to Newcastle, my work became significantly more systematic because it was a hard-headed intellectual place where there was a lot of conceptual art being made and there was no painting at all when I got there. None at all. 
and uh, they had a huge corridor connecting the old building to the new building and nobody would hang work there because that was considered uncool. In fact, making art was in a way self-demeaning. So of course, me, being the way I am, I started hanging all my paintings in the corridor and the others were saying things like, oh yeah, look at him hanging his paintings in the corridor, which of course was in fact true. I was hanging my paintings in. <laughs> so if one said, oh look at him hanging his paintings in the corridor, that would actually be a statement of fact. And after a while, jealousy set in and other people started making paintings and hanging them in the corridor. And after a few years, Newcastle was a painting art school. It's very interesting how it happened. Just one person coming from the south with a love of painting and people started to realize that it was more fun than um, making conceptual art. And a friend of mine had saved up all his money to buy a, a toilet, ceramic toilet. And it's amazing what you can find second hand if you, re you really research. He found one for a distress price. He filled it with paint and he put a canvas on the wall, so this was going to be an action painting, see? And then I had agreed to participate in this. One, two, three, and then we practiced and practiced. And on the last throw, after many practices, we threw it and it hit the wall and bounced off and broke on the floor and one little piece of paint made its way up to the canvas. <laughs> and just at that moment, the professor, who thought I had been parachuted in from heaven to save the art school, walked by and just shook his head in profound sorrow because he thought that I had been recruited by the conceptualists. But of course I hadn't. But this is just to give you an idea of the flavor of the place. It was very heady. This is a painting that was made with tape. It was square. And I turned it. It was made with green stripes painted vertically, stained into the canvas. And then I turned it and sprayed. And then I left it. And it intimates something about the future which is a sense of romanticism. So even at my most systematic, the romantic was never more than just behind the curtain away. This was a painting I also made as an undergraduate. It's layered systems. It looks like a computer painting, but it's important to note that in those days computers didn't exist. That was painted in 1970. But it earned me an incredible amount of notoriety when I made these overlapping, superimposed grid paintings where I was trying to create chaos from order. I was trying to use the systems to the point where they became nonsensical. In fact, just like the world we live in. I was experimenting here too with these lines, overlapping drawings. Always, always searching, always looking. Here's a painting, another painting that I made as an undergraduate. So you can see there's quite a lot of variety in the work. There's illusionism, very great interest in surface. Again, a, a kind of mystic light in the back. Illumination has always been an issue in my work. These are very hard-headed tape, cut tape, pulled out, systematic, relating of course to a lot of craft like dyeing, carpet making, so on, map making. Um, 
very much about craft and system and less about personal expression. This painting is a painting that was bought by Crawford almost as soon as it was made. And when I left, did you buy it? Oh, okay. So, um, oh yeah, because I, I was making, you were here, you, in fact, you were here in the... Um, it, it was purchased by a group of corporate Yeah, agents. yeah, that's yeah, right. It, it, Dr. Carney and Gerald Goldberg and a few gathered yeah. together. Yeah, that was in the Crustaceous period. And then I actually painted this in the Jurassic period. Yeah, so that's right. So that was painted in 1973. And I'll tell you a great story about this. Sorry I'm taking so long, but you'll get over it. And um, I, I, I was a very naive boy, you know, I mean a working class boy. I was up in Newcastle. My grandfather was a, a miner in Durham, and I stayed with them for a little while when I first went up there. And <clears throat> when I came to London, I found myself in a gallery called the Rowan Gallery, which was run by a guy called Alec Gregory Hood, who I became deeply attached to, who was a wonderful person. He was a war hero, a colonel, but after the Second World War, he was so disgusted by this cruel spectacle that he'd been involved with that he opened a contemporary art gallery and started sleeping with men. And just to confirm his alternative lifestyle. So he showed stuff that his, all his friends, his tough friends, thought was really nuts, including my work. He was related to Robin Hood, actually, lives in Loxley. And I went round to the gallery. I had to stretch up these paintings that I'd made in America. This one is called East Coast Light. It's in the collection here. Uh, it was bought for 800 pounds, ooh, and, which I've already spent, by the way. And they were on these rough-made stretchers that I had to put together. And I went to the gallery. Alex said to me, um, well, help yourself to all the champagne that you want, my dear. And I thought, wow, this is different. And because I hadn't actually had champagne. So I opened a bottle of champagne, drank a bottle of champagne, and I'm putting this together, you know, with the thing. And, and then <clears throat> that was all right, so I decided to have another one. So I was on the second bottle of champagne, screwing in the triangles, and um, I remember being on one side of the gallery throwing the triangles over. And I threw one of the triangles over and I watched in horror as it turned slowly in the air and came down in the middle of the back of the painting and stuck up like a flag. Oops. In the middle of that painting. So, I staggered over and kind of went like this and fixed it up best I could and then continued stretching the painting. Nobody's ever said a word about it. <laughs> but there it is. That's in the back of your painting. It actually has a hole in it. But What you don't know about obviously doesn't hurt you. And this is an homage to Boston where I went on a fellowship. I, I always was very good at scrounging. Scrounged my way over to America and I was very impressed by the East Coast light of Boston, which is fantastic bright light. And I made a series of paintings, three of them, with this white light. This is a work on paper, staining into the thing, but you can see I've become 
really a grid painter at this point. These are the last paintings that are made in England. I had a very successful early career, so I decided to destroy it by making paintings like this with rollers that were very unglamorous and undesirable for the bourgeoisie. And I was successful at being unsuccessful. <laughs> I made these paintings with, with rough paint, with a roller, masking tape, very simple, and I painted them backwards in the sense that I painted layers, put tape on to mark the layers, and put tape on the other way and then pulled it all out the end. So they're kind of archaeological. And I was getting rid of the illusionism in the paintings because I wanted to be a serious painter like the one that I am now. <laughs> see, these are systematic drawings. You can see that I'm playing around with ideas of darkening and density, but also relating quite strongly to my experiences as a typesetter in the early days when I worked in Notting Hill Gate, setting type. This is a very recent work. Um, I called it Horizontal Soul. I was very ill at the time, so I, I felt very strung out, stretched out. And also, uh, I always like Rubber Soul more than all the other albums by the Beatles. So I called it Horizontal Soul. It's made with uh, six panels, all on metal, and um, it changes slightly. The colors change very slightly, the divisions change very slightly, and it's all painted intuitively. So it's kind of systematic in a certain way, or insistent, obsessive, but I'm always allowing for my hand, my personality, and of course they are the colors of sadness, because they're gray. I think that's the end. Oh no. This is one of the recent paintings, a landline painting. My recent work <clears> has <throat> changed a little bit. You know, I'm sorry I didn't include a wall of light painting for you, which have horizontals and verticals and relate to the idea of the war with a metaphysical um, ambition, of course, wall of light, which I showed at the Met. The recent paintings I've started to make are much more influenced by landscape, and you can see the colors of the landscape, but of course they are emphatically abstract, but they give a nod to the natural world. And I am a, a romantic painter, of course, so I will always return to muddled up color, a lot of brush stroke. Then brush stroke is more active in the recent work because the drawing is weaker. So if less drawing, the less you have to describe, the freer you are, in a sense, just to make marks. So they have a, a very nice kind of back and forth, horizontal, movement side to side and there are deep spaces within the bands. Um, yeah, here's another one I just did. That one's called Jakarta. I was thinking about Jakarta. I've never been there, but I imagine it looks like that. So <laughs> I imagine something hot and exotic with a kind of emerald green color somewhere and the color of earth. It's a very hot painting. And as you can see, I don't paint out to the edges, and I love this kind of bitten quality that gives it a kind of fragility, poetry, down the edges. I always like this in the work of Giacometti, whose figures look as if they've been eaten by the world. Yeah, that is uh, Landline C. That's in a church that I'm going to open on my birthday on uh, Montserrat. It refers to the sea. You can see the metal at the bottom. I left that showing. So there's, there, there, 
paintings that I'm doing at the moment are significantly more casual than the paintings I was doing, let's say, in the tens. So we'll go into these issues, I imagine, more in depth. This is a very recent painting. This is really quite crazy because it's very big and kind of mad. And this horizontal motion is insistent, but so are the interruptions. It's almost like views from a train window. You get a sense of speed or breaking, interrupted, truncated vision, and also these panels that are banged together. It's very interesting to me. So I think that brings us up to date. And I um, hope that was all right. So um, shall we agree we just going to ask you a few questions first and then maybe throw it open to the floor? All right, sure. So, um, the, the, this exhibition is the first time you've shown any of the early work, any of the bigger work. And people who haven't seen it don't know about it. Why, why did you choose to figure out the show it out? Was there a particular reason in your career? Well, uh, I'm not exactly sure. I guess um, it's because I can. <laughs> I, <laughs> I usually do things when I can do them. And uh, I had a, a girlfriend. Well, I've had more than one girlfriend. Not at the same time. Yeah, I've had more than one at the same time. <laughs> uh, so anyway, she was looking after all these, these drawings for many, many years. And she gave them to me not long ago. Then I had them restored by a wonderful woman in England, paper restorer. She did a great job. So, of course, they were all restored, and I was very proud of them, very happy about it. So I decided that I'd like to do it, you know. It, it was a great idea for a, for a kind of, I don't know, a sort of modest show, you know. I'm not trying to impress anybody with it, but just trying to show something, show a journey. And <clears throat> I, I come very much from the figure, and I have a great interest in the figure, and I'm a very, as you can tell, communicative person. I care very deeply about people. So, I'm not a, I'm not a remote abstract painter. I'm not a conceptual abstract painter. And I wanted to show that. And in Ireland right now, it's possible to see work from 1964 right up to now. There's three exhibitions on, which is fantastic. Four, if you include the permanent collection in the Hugh Lane. Yeah, and in the room in the Hugh Lane. Well, you can only do that in your own country because it's only in your own country that they like you enough to give you the opportunity to do that. <laughs> people, people who haven't dug into your work um, know you to be a very abstract artist, but in fact the figuration has stayed there throughout and a lot of your paintings or portraits to people are, are old to places. Is that the case? Yeah, I wouldn't say that I was an abstract artist. I like abstraction. In fact, I love it. And I love the freedom of it. I love being able to put things together, paint them the way I want to paint them, set up all these different rhythms. Um, but it's sort of like somebody who plays a musical instrument, or like Keith Jarrett, wonderful pianist, 
he wasn't really making abstraction, he was making music. And I think that it's it's very it's very beautiful to be able to give people freedom. And um, on the other hand, you know, I'm always giving my work titles that make it clear that my paintings are not really removed, one could say. You know, titles like Window, Passenger, Passenger being a smaller painting inside a bigger painting, Union, two things being together that are highly related, Mirror, one being a reflection of the other, Wall of Light, which is the idea of a wall that submits to spirit and light. Finally, landline, inserts. So there's always this sense in my work of a relationship with the world, and it's emphatically expressed, and the materiality of things, and I don't cut that off, you know, I don't make paintings and call, give them abstract names, you know, that you can't figure out. I think of, in terms of abstraction, my work is pretty accessible. Do you do it as, 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 as you turn 70? You've always described yourself as being from, from here, being an, an, an uh, Irish artist. And as being Irish, being a huge influence on, on, on the work, you can you feel the influence of being Irish in, in the work you see it yourself? I, I think that my ambition, which is absurd and my more or less uh, indestructible nature has a lot to do with where I come from. It's not really possible to discourage me. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> and you know, I, I was born I was born into a, an, an immensely broken situation, and I'm not the only Irish person, of course, who can say that. Um, if you go to uh, Kearney Castle, you'll see that there's only two families that have the right to be buried there, and that's the Kearneys and the Scullies. And my son, one of his names is Vincent, it's not for Vincent van Gogh, it's for Vincent Scully, whose tomb is right smack in the middle of the castle. So I have a great sense of being uh, broken, coming from great damage. My grandfather hung himself, for example. And um, when we went to England, my dad had to go to prison, same prison where my grandfather hung himself, Aldershot. And I come from the street. We had nowhere to live. We had nothing to eat. So I went to New York, which was the most difficult place you could go to and run by the most unfriendly, exclusionary, unkind bunch of monkeys that I ever met in my entire life. And, you know, when they say, welcome to the Big Apple, the Big Apple's all eaten out. And I went at exactly the wrong time, it was in the mid-70s when it would seem that the hegemony of the New York art world, a domination of New York minimalism, was unbreakable. Who would have known that five years later it would fall on its face and the Germans would drive over it? 
but it happened. But in 1975, it didn't look as if it was going to happen. And I had a very tough time. But you see, the thing is, I was made for it. You know? I mean, it's just not possible to stop somebody like me. Like, it wasn't possible to stop um, Muhammad Ali. Because he's just not discourageable. And I wasn't either. So, I, I was just, I was able to, to do it. And, and in fact, I remember thinking later on that my view of things was so distorted that I would recognize discouragement as encouragement. I would read that, you know, I mean, if you did that with traffic lights, you know, if you mistook red for green, you would probably get killed. But in my case, it worked out. It, it was positive because the sarcasm of New York, the cruelty of it was, is very dry and dishonest. It's an extraordinarily dishonest place. And run by a bunch of cowards, really. I mean, if you confront them, they go all silent and silly. And I didn't recognize these signs of discouragement. They just didn't compute, because my, uh, my background was so rough, you know, so deprived, that I thought it was quite okay. Because I can live on rather a, a little amount of encouragement. I mean, I get so much encouragement now, I hardly know what to do with it. <laughs> so we have about 10 minutes to play this. Yeah. Does anybody want to fire a question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Sean, about 30 years ago, I read an interview with you in the Sunday Times, and you spoke about standing in front of a painting at the museum in England, the National Gallery, at the Hall, and you spoke about the physicality of the chair and the spiritual quality of, of the painting, and you spoke about being arrested at that spot for quite a while. I hope I've represented you fairly. And you have. Was, when I read that, I got the gift of learning how Just let me explain a little bit about the painting, if I may. What I, what I found about the Van Gogh painting, you know, it was just a painting of a chair. I was very driven to enter art, but of course I was intimidated. And at that time, I was working as a plasterer's laborer in the Victoria Station ballroom. We were doing the ceiling. And when you make plaster for plasterers, and they do ceilings, 50% of it is returned. Because <laughs> they go like this, and then it's coming down on you all day long. So, what I would do is go down to the Tate Gallery. It was in the Tate Gallery then, it's moved now, National Gallery. And, and I'd grab a pork pie, and stick it in my mouth, and drive my scooter down, park it and run in. I spent 10 minutes every day looking at the painting. And what was so beautiful to me about the painting was its extraordinary honesty. 
That's what arrested me. So I, I was able to enter the world of art. It wasn't so sophisticated, you know, it wasn't too sophisticated. It gave me an access. So I looked at the painting every single day and then I drove back and went back to work. And thank God for being born, you know, before parking meters were invented <laughs> and, and free entrance because it didn't cost me anything. <laughs> but I'm so happy that that helped you and that's what we're here for. We're here to help each other. That's the point of life. Thank you, and thank you for the inspiring introduction to the race of seeing and the creation work. And that's the thing you mentioned for its beauty and spirituality. And I think frequent, I think sometimes um, beauty seems to be more of a threatening agent in, in the abandoned in the creation of, of art to our great loss. And I think there's tremendous courage in the act of creating something that has got an honesty of which beauty is part of the person that's first of all. I'm not sure if there's anything else you've to say that you need in relation to beauty. Can you hear Yeah, well, <clears throat> of course, Beauty is at the moment under threat, as it should be, because beauty and colonization have gone hand in hand. So people who didn't conform to what was decreed as beautiful were considered ugly. Now we are in a period where we are trying to make the world more inclusive and um, where there's less bias sexually and uh, gender based, race based, culture based so the whole issue of beauty as a canon is under great threat and that's bound to happen if you give everybody a fair shake. So if you want art, you know, if you want people in Africa to be able to send us their art or Chinese people to send us their art, then the whole issue of beauty comes into question, there's no security anymore and it's a very difficult subject to prove. Um, my, my own sense of beauty is always a little broken. I like things that are um, imperfect. I, 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 I don't like the idea of beauty as a perfect thing and I, I, just to give you an example, I find the paintings of Mondrian to be very difficult. You know, I, I, it, to me it would, it's like kissing a marble statue. I mean it looks great, I guess, but it's so final and, and it's very puritanical and I find that very difficult. So this question is, is, a, is a complicated one. I had a dialogue with Arthur Danto, a great philosopher, American philosopher who died, who's a very dear friend of mine, and um, he said that beauty was uh, abandoned, that he used the term she she has been left in the margins somehow because we're dealing with other issues. But I think, you know, when those are worked through, notions of beauty will re-establish themselves. But of course, to have beauty, you have to have some sort of agreement on it. You know, like most people think that Brad Pitt is beautiful. And I think he's beautiful. 
Um, and uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind if I looked more like Brad Pitt. I wouldn't. Be. But um, but of course, I wouldn't want Brad Pitt's career instead of my career. So <laughs> all, all in all, I'm okay. But these these standards are, are are very difficult, you know. And in America, black people thought that they weren't getting a fair shake because the women didn't think that they were seen as beautiful. So all these things are subject to notions, political and notions of fairness, openness, inclusiveness. So if we are open, openly inclusive, then we have to say, well, you know, it comes to beauty, well, you know, you're beautiful and you're not beautiful. Or you're beautiful, but not as beautiful as the other one over there. And then it, it becomes difficult. But um, my, my own personal idea of beauty is that, you know, I mostly like women that are a bit funny looking. And um, I like beauty that's a little awkward. You know, it has a kind of fallibility in it. That, that moves me. So uh, my idea of beauty is uh, connected to empathy. To say, yeah, that's where I'm, that's, I think that's where I am. But it is a very complicated subject right now. No, let's do one more. Yeah, he's got a nice beard, which I find beautiful. Well, <clears throat> of course, the west of Ireland is amazingly beautiful. I think England and Ireland are, honest, quite honestly for me, the most beautiful countries in the world. But, you know, I'm sure other people like the desert, so <laughs> we go again with beauty. So, I, I would say that I'm allowing more um, freedom. I find that since I have my son, I, uh, my new son, I'm a lot more relaxed and there is a stronger connection to landscape painting but the problem with painting in relation to other art forms is that it has a tendency to fall into sentimentality. You know, there's a problem with some people that I have an exhibition in the National Gallery in Ireland, you know, and they think that's some sort of sacrilege putting a person like me in the natural, National Gallery with their uh, B minus collection, which I'm sure it is. Um, but. Is it not just because you're alive? It's, yeah, it's because it's, it's cause, it's cause I'm alive, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but. I always, I always joke that, you know, I don't do pictures of fishermen in Connemara with patches on their bums, you know. I, I, I want to make something that's, that is also, in some sense, formidable, that's noble. And in that sense, I would say that my cousin in art is Cezanne. In that, I mean, Cezanne, you have to be in the mood, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of work. And you have to be in the mood, I think, for my work. It's pretty tough work. But I am allowing more mm, feeling into it, let's say, but I, I wouldn't like it if it got sentimental. You know, there's always that problem, I think with painting, particularly since painting has come under a attack so much. 
but it is making a comeback. Yay for Peter. Yeah. <laughs> the young ones are making a comeback with it. Are you happy to wrap? I'm so happy. So happy. <laughs> oh, I'm just so happy. So the exhibition is opening at 6 o'clock with a Prosecco and Canopy reception, and we hope you'll join us. With a Prosecco, no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> there is a catalogue accompanying the show with essays by Sean and Beata that had the show in Koblenz and very lovely magazine. And there's a limited number of those that are signed by Sean. And we would just like to thank John Bowen and the board and Peter and everybody at the Crawford and very much to Sean. <laughs>